Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. Climate alarmists always tell me how much they love peer review, so that's exactly what we're going to do in this video. We're going to review an article which appeared last year in the Journal of Climate. The article is titled, Factors Contributing to Record-Breaking Heat Waves Over the Great Plains During the 1930s Dust Bowl. The main points of the article were that summers were very hot during the 1930s, the heat waves were associated with drought, and that climate models predict more heat waves in the future. The article is written by six academics from the UK and Australia. It's a long paper, so we're just going to discuss a few key sections. The authors say, record-breaking summer heat waves were experienced across the contiguous United States during the decade-long Dust Bowl drought in the 1930s. Despite the sparser station coverage in the early record, there is robust evidence for the emergence of exceptional heat waves across the central Great Plains. Then they explain how summer heat waves tend to be longer and hotter following a dry spring. It's very generous of modern academics to acknowledge the fact that key portions of American history actually occurred. During the 1930s, millions of people who lived in the Great Plains fled the heat and drought and moved to California. High school kids used to read John Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath, which documented this exodus. Now let's look at the report again. The report seems to imply that there was sparser station coverage during the 1930s than there is now. Let's examine that claim by looking at the actual data. This is a graph of the number of U.S. historical climatology network stations reporting during summer since 1895. During the 1930s, there was between 900 and 1,000 stations reporting. And now there's between 800 and 900 stations reporting. So there were actually more stations reporting during the 1930s than there are now. It appears that the people who wrote the paper made some assumptions and didn't look at the actual station coverage. It also appears that peer review failed to discover this error. Then the article says, the aptly named dust ball drought that plagued the contiguous United States during the 1930s caused widespread misfortune for many regional communities and severely dented the emerging economy. It covered almost one-third of the United States. Peterson et al. 2013. Let's look and see if that claim is true. During the summer of 1934, about 80% of the U.S. was in moderate to extreme drought, most of that severe or extreme. If the authors are only referring to the Dust Bowl region itself, that was actually only a small area centered around the Oklahoma Panhandle. And if they were talking about heat, this was the temperature anomaly map for the United States for July 1934 from the U.S. Weather Bureau. You can see that almost the entire United States was well above normal temperatures. So where did they get the almost one-third of the United States in drought number from? They got the number from another paper, Peterson et al. 2013. But the Dust Bowl drought was much larger than just one-third of the United States. They didn't do their own research, but rather relied on somebody else's paper. And peer review failed to detect the error either in this paper or in the 2013 paper. So peer review failed not just once, but at least twice, and probably many other times. The record heat covered a much larger area than one-third of the United States centered around the Great Plains. This map shows in red all the states which set their all-time temperature record during the 1930s. You can see that states as far apart as New Jersey, Florida, and Oregon all set their all-time maximum temperature record during that decade. That's obviously a lot more than one-third of the United States. It appears once again that the authors failed to do their research and that peer review failed to discover their error. The pink states are ones which set their all-time record prior to the 1930s. This included the world's record temperature of 134 degrees Fahrenheit in California during July 1913. And the brown states set their records after the 1930s, but prior to carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere reaching 350 parts per million in 1988. So only four states set their all-time temperature record since carbon dioxide levels reached 350 parts per million in the atmosphere. And to make matters worse, the Arizona and Nevada records from 1994 are both likely bogus. Let's take a look now at how hot summers used to be in the United States prior to 1960. This graph shows the May through September average maximum temperature at all U.S. historical climatology network stations. You can see that prior to 1960, summer afternoon temperatures in the United States were much hotter than they have been over the past 60 years. 
This graph shows the percent of May through September days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit across the entire United States. Once again, you can see that the period from about 1910 until 1955 was much hotter than the past 60 years. Same story with 95 degree days, which is 35 degrees Celsius. From 1910 to 1955, summers were much hotter than the past 60 years. And again, the same story with 100 degree days as shown in this graph. This next set of figures are in the 2017 National Climate Assessment. Like the graphs I just showed you, these graphs show that summers were hotter in the United States from about 1910 until the mid-1950s. Now let's go back again and look at the report which we are reviewing. It says, the record-breaking heat waves experienced during the Dust Bowl decade were not isolated incidences, but part of systematically hotter summers that emerged around 1930 across the Midwestern United States and peaked in 1936. Cook et al. 2014, Donat et al. 2016. Now let's look at the author's own temperature graph which they included in their report. Their own temperature graph shows that summers were hotter from 1910 through the mid-1950s than they have been over the past 60 years, just like all the other graphs we've been looking at. The elevated temperatures did not begin in 1930 as the text of the article claims. It actually began around 1910. And their maps show in blue that the record heat covered a much larger area than just one-third of the United States. So once again, they were relying on other people's conclusions from other people's papers rather than using the actual data. And peer review failed to pick up the error in all cases. Let's look now at the actual temperature data from the United States Historical Climatology Network. There are 1,218 stations in the network. And this graph shows the number of those stations which set their all-time maximum record during each year going back to the 1880s. It's pretty easy to see that the majority of these stations set the record prior to 1960. And many of these stations which have set recent records are due to the fact that those stations just came online recently and they don't have data from the 1930s or the 1950s. There's no question that U.S. summer afternoon temperatures have been getting cooler over the last hundred years. The data is unequivocal. To get a feel for how hot the 1930s were, let's look at one station at Seymour, Indiana. Seymour, Indiana had 49 days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit from June 17, 1936 until September 16, three months later. And during that spell, they had 20 consecutive days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, peaking at 111 degrees Fahrenheit. Remember that number, 20 consecutive days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit during 1936. Now let's compare that to the number of 100 degree days they've had total since 1955. Over the past 65 years, Seymour, Indiana has only had 19 days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So in 1936, they had more consecutive days over 100 than they've had total in the past 60 years. And the hottest temperature Seymour has had since 1955 was 104 degrees compared to 111 degrees in 1936. Also note that Seymour has not had any 100 degree days in the past seven years. We know that summers have gotten much cooler in the United States and heat waves have become much less intense and frequent. Now let's go back and look at the Journal of Climate paper one more time. The paper says, managing the risk that heat waves pose is underscored by the fact that state-of-the-art climate models project an intensification of heat extremes across the United States and Canada in upcoming decades and beyond. And then they cite a bunch of references for that. These state-of-the-art models all assume that carbon dioxide levels increasing will produce more heat waves. But historical data does not back up the basis of the climate models. This graph shows the May through September percent of days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the United States versus atmospheric carbon dioxide going back to 1895. You can see that the percent of hot days peaked at atmospheric CO2 levels of 310 parts per million, and that as CO2 has increased, the number of hot days has declined. So the sensible conclusion would have been that heat waves and CO2 levels don't correlate with each other, and that the climate models don't work. This, of course, was not picked up by the authors or by the people who reviewed the paper. They cling to established dogma about the relationship between carbon dioxide and heat waves and ignore the actual evidence. Climate alarmists will respond to this video by saying, well, the United States is just 2% of the Earth, but the 1934 drought was actually worldwide. It wasn't just in the Midwestern United States. The chief meteorologist of the U.S. Weather Bureau published this article in June 1934. Worldwide drought is seen likely. 
In this Australian paper, the Mercury reported the same thing in June 1934. World drought, farmers' ruinous losses, almost universal disaster. Europe revives pagan rites. During 1934, it was reported that England was having their worst drought in nearly 100 years. The Journal of Climate paper claimed that the drought covered almost one-third of the United States, when in fact it covered the entire planet. It's hard to imagine how much more wrong they could have been. And it's difficult to imagine how much more worthless climate science peer review could possibly be. For me, the key takeaway from all this is this line from the 1934 Mercury article, Europe revives pagan rights. With the climate conference COP25 going on in Europe this week, pagans are once again trying to take control of the climate. These are pagans at Bondi Beach in Sydney, Australia. They're protesting what they believe is sea level rise. Here's the same picture from 1989, from 1909, and from around 1889. There's no indication that sea level is rising at Bondi Beach, and there's no indication that heat waves are getting worse in the United States. And there's certainly no reason to believe that climate models or peer-reviewed climate science research is of any value in the real world. The only things which peer-reviewed climate science and climate models seem to be good for is obtaining funding and giving politicians the leverage which they seek. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.